with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 3. We continue our exegetical study of this wonderful book. <coughs> a few weeks ago, as I was working on this message, the news broke about a gunman in an Oregon high school. Do you remember the story? When the shooting started at our high school in Portland, Oregon, early Tuesday, he stood at Jamie Infante didn't recognize the sound of the gunshot. She thought maybe someone had dropped a book. In reality, a lone gunman had opened fire to school, killing one student and forcing others to flee. An assistant principal told students to go into lockdown mode. At the end, he said, this is not a drill. All schools practice that these days. That's sad that we even practice that, but all schools practice that these days. Teased teacher suffered a non-life-threatening injury. He was treated at the scene. At the time that I was working on the message, they had not released the gunman, the gunman's name, and they have now. Authorities were working to notify the parents. Can you imagine being a parent that morning of one of those students? How horrible that must have been waiting. About an hour after the shooting, Oregon police so they had secured the situation that it was contained. The shooting happened about 8 a.m. at Reynolds High School in Troutville, about 12 miles east of Portland. Classes were in session at the time. Details about what led to the shooting weren't immediately available. A couple of SWAT team members responded and said, without quick and well-executed response, this tragedy could have been much worse. Thank God that they responded quickly. Anxious parents waiting for news of their children were on pins and needles. One couple, Craig and Tawana, waited to hear about the news from Chris. Finally, as they were talking to CNN reporters, their phone rang. And it was Chris. He was all right. Mom said, oh, thank God. Don't you know that was a heart to Oh, thank God. That's what we've been waiting for. A prayer vigil was planned. It happened this past Tuesday. My heart is heavy after learning of this morning's tragic events at Reynolds High School, said the court, the Oregon governor. My thoughts and prayers are with the students, the staff, and the Reynolds High School community. We now know that Jared Michael Patchett was the shooter, and he fatally shot Amelia Hoffman and a PE teacher as well. Pastor Keith Evans, would you like to be the pastor of this event? Pastor Keith Evans talked about how difficult it was. He said, we've seen school shootings before, all of us have. He said, but this time they were our friends on the television. We knew these people. He said, something broke in Jerry that day. We cannot control what happens, but how we respond. And that is a true statement. Everyone was sad and heartbroken for the victims and family members of the Bible. May I say conservatively that this is out of control in America? This is out of control. How can we deal with this crisis? And from my perspective, there is only one way to deal with this crisis, and that is the supremacy of Christ. That's the only thing that's going to solve these kind of crises. When Christ is supreme, people do things like love one another. They do not steal, they do not kill, they do not lie, they do not bear false witness. But only when Christ rules supreme. school violence in a moment. But let's turn our attention now to John. He's still talking to his disciples about jealousy among believers. Remember that's where we were last time. About the believers of John, jealous of the believers of Jesus, and people leaving their church to go to another church. You know, same stuff that we do today. Jealousy. He knew that it would end when Christ was supreme in his disciples' hearts and lives. That's why he was willing to exalt Christ and allow John to be diminished. That's exactly what John wanted. Now this passage of scripture says that Jesus is above everything, not above some things. He is above everything in the universe. So notice with me this morning, first of all, Christ is above all. There is one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth 
belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is what? Above all. John's trying to tell his disciples why he is willing to decrease and let Jesus increase or why he's willing to let the spotlight fade on him and let the spotlight burn brighter on Jesus. The one referring to Jesus who comes from above is literally above all. I mean, he came from heaven, which is above, but he is above even heaven. Jesus is not of this world, he declares to his followers. Now make a note that John refers to him as above three times. Then he compares himself to Jesus by talking about the one from the earth. Now we, we identify with that person. This is where we're from. We're made from the dust of this earth. We are earth beings. We know that. The one he is referring to is himself. And he is from the earth. He can only speak about things from the earth. I speak about what I know to be true. John said there's light, there's gravity, there's hunger, there's depression, there's anger. There's all those things on earth. And I understand those, John said. I am from this world. But the one referring to Jesus who comes from heaven is above all. He is not from this world. He created this world. John, I think, is just about ready to shout when he testifies about Jesus. I mean, you can feel the excitement building in him. When he thinks about the love and the supremacy of Christ, he gets his motor running. Then later in the Bible, we see a guy who, when he's writing about the supremacy of Christ, also begins to shout. The Bible says, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him, all things, all things, please don't think that's some things, all things were created. Things in heaven, He made heaven. Things on earth, and things, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> visible and invisible, where the thrones are powers, rulers are authorities, all things were created by Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. So, so we're just the body. He's the head. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He may have what? The supremacy. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through what? Through his blood. You cannot write enough laws. You cannot take enough guns. You cannot give enough guns. It's only through the blood of Jesus that peace comes. That's the only place it comes. So we must talk about the supremacy of Christ. Yes, I am for holding together. Yes, I am for helping one another. You don't hold on to Jesus, you're going to miss it. It is the supremacy of Christ and His blood was shed on the cross. When you get around people, listen to them. They'll testify about what they really believe about Jesus. Now, they won't know they're testifying, they're just talking. But God says it's from the issues of the heart that come out of the mouth. That's what can be a man. It's not what you put in the mouth. So just listen to them. I spoke with a lady about church, and as we were getting the conversation, she said, well, good luck. And then she corrected herself. She said, you know, luck is no longer in my vocabulary. I know Jesus is in control, and he will take care of everything. She testified to what she believed. It's not about luck. It's about Jesus being in charge. Christ is above all. Now, next week, you're going to get to hear a lady talk about Christ being above all. Don't miss an end. It'll be a good time together. So when you get around people, listen to them. Listen to their testimony. Not only is Christ above all, but we also see that we are to accept His testimony. He testifies to what He has seen and heard. But no one accepts His testimony. The man who has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. John testifies about the sinfulness of the people and their need to repent. And that sinfulness has not changed. Our need to repent has not changed. Repenting is always a good thing. If you ever think repenting is not a good thing, then you're listening to the wrong person talk. You're listening to the enemy side. Jesus always leads us to repent. So just know that repenting is always a good thing. That is from the Lord. You know that. So John says, listen to
to the testimony of Jesus. Yes, he told Nicodemus he needed to repent and be born again. But Jesus often talks about heaven and hell. Sometimes make a study about the times Jesus talks about sin as opposed to heaven and hell. I think you'll be surprised. You see, Christ's testimony is just like ours. He testifies to what he has seen and what he's heard. In fact, he's from heaven. He's seen and heard a lot more. His testimony is what he has seen and heard. Then when people hear him testify, they simply reject it. They say, I don't believe that. Why would I believe that? That doesn't make any sense. But when a person does accept his testimony, they pass from death to life. Now this idea of certified carries the intent of setting to his seal or the affixing of an official seal to it. It was a legal idea of putting your signet ring into hot wax and then sticking it to the document. That's what they did in Bible days. Today, it would be you meeting at the attorney's office, sitting down with some witnesses, and him saying, get out your pen, you've got to sign the next 37 pages. <laughs> and they've got them all highlighted in yellow. They've got tabs on them. You don't have to read all the stuff. They just flip to them. Have you ever been in one of those? You're just signing. You're just signing. You're just signing. That's the same thing. You're putting your name on the dotted line. When you receive Christ's testimony, you affix your seal, or you put your name on the dotted line. Do you believe the testimony of Jesus? That's the question. You see, Jesus talked about what he knew to be true. Jesus talked about marriage in the garden. He said there was a man named Adam, and there was a woman named Eve. And you know what? If you don't believe in Adam and Eve, you don't believe the testimony of Jesus. He testified that what he saw was true. He says, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave only to his wife. Jesus created Adam and Eve. He was there. What about Abraham? He said, Abraham was, but I am. When Abraham left early Chaldees, Jesus was the one who called him. Jesus said, you just start walking, I'll tell you when to stop. Now, Baptists could never live like that. Baptists want to know where it is, how far it is, how much gasoline prices are, how many miles is going to take on their car, and they want to know all the details before they'll pray and see if God wants them to go do something. That's just bad. But that's not Scripture. You see, God says, pack up your stuff, Abraham, and start walking. He said, where are we going? He said, I'll tell you when you get there. That's Jesus' testimony. So Abraham started walking. He starts walking. Finally, he gets to the promised land. And then God says, I want you to offer your son on Mount Moriah, the same place where Jesus himself would be offered about a thousand years later. Jesus was there both times. That's his testimony. Noah. He said, Noah, I want you to go build an ark. He said, I'm going to give you some instructions. He told him how long to make it, how wide to make it, how tall to make it. He said, I'm going to send two of every kind of creatures to you. You will have to go hunt them up. I'm going to send them. I'm going to send you two dogs. And from two dogs come every breed of dog there's ever been. I'm going to send you two cats, and from two cats came every breed of cats there's ever been. I'm going to send you two, two of a kind. Read the story. Jesus says Noah was real. When he got in the boat and he closed the door, Jesus shut the door. When the rain came, Jesus sent the rain. When he came out, Jesus was still there. If you don't believe in Noah, you don't believe the testimony of Jesus. That was his testimony about Noah. And then there's Isaiah. When Isaiah saw the Lord high lifted up in the temple, and smoke filled the place, and his train filled the temple, he saw the angels of God. Guess who was sitting on the throne? Jesus. Jesus testified about that. David, when he prophesied about Christ, <clears throat> Jesus put those songs in his heart. Jesus allowed him to play that guitar, to strum those strings and make that music. And then there's Daniel. Daniel fasted and prayed, and Jesus honored his commitment. He said, if you won't eat that stuff that's bad for you, I'll make you healthier than the rest. Daniel did, and he was. When Daniel was thrown to the lion's den, Jesus sent the angels to shut the mouths of the lions. That's the testimony of Jesus. Jesus said there's a great gulf fixed between Abraham's bosom and hell. Luke 16. He knows about it because he created it. He says, once you get into hell, you cannot get out. But Father Abraham sent somebody to dip their finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in these flames. Jesus understood that. He created it. That's his testimony. Well, I don't believe it. Then you don't believe Jesus. That's his testimony. You have fixed your seal to it when you believe it. You sign your name on the dotted line. He died to keep you out of that place. If you go there, it's by your own choice. He won't send you. 
you choose to go by rejecting him as your Lord and Savior. And then Jesus testified by heaven. This really messed him up. I mean, they couldn't get things of earth. They didn't understand earthly stuff. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to build a place for you. And where I am there, you can come and we can be together. Because I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. Come on, let's go. And they said, we don't believe that. Then you'll miss it. Because that is Jesus' testimony about heaven. But there's only one way in. Only one way. You cannot be good enough to get into his presence. You cannot. The only thing that will get you in his presence is the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. It's the blood of Jesus. Always has been, always will be. And then Jesus talked about building the church. He knows how to build it. He knows where to plant it. He knows how to make it grow. And guess what? He said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He knows what he's doing. It's a matter of following him. Churches that follow him. That's not an issue. It's when we do it our way that becomes the issue. Now, nobody can make you believe the testimony of Jesus. But I pray that this morning you'll put your name on the dotted line and say, If Jesus said it, I'm for it. I may not understand all of it. You know, I don't understand much about heaven. I've never been. I plan on going, but I've never been. I don't know what those mansions look like. I, I, I don't know what the streets of gold look like. I've not seen it, but because he said it was so, that's good enough for me. It's believing his testimony. You must believe his testimony, and you must receive him as your Lord and Savior. We'll talk about that in just a second. It is a life-changing commitment to him. It's putting your name on the line. It's being willing to sign page after page after page. I believe Jesus. And then there's Christ's accountability, the third one. Well, the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God gives the Spirit without limit. Well, that's a good promise. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. Whoever believes in the Son has what? Eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life. For God's wrath remains. It doesn't come. It's already there. It remains on Him. Now, that's with me in verse 34, the Spirit of God. For the one who God sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Lord Jesus had all the Holy Spirit his whole life. He spoke by the will and the power of the Spirit, by the Spirit. His humanity did not impair him from speaking or telling the truth of God. Remember the scripture with me. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was indwelt by the Holy Spirit, filled by the Holy Spirit, and in his baptism anointed by the Holy Spirit, God literally gave him the Spirit without limit. And offers the same thing to you. And then notice with me, the Son of God. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything, not some things, not most things. He has placed His church in His hand. And Jesus can do with it what He wants to. He's placed your life in His hand. And He can do with it what He wants to. Everything is in His hand. Now let me ask you, have you ever bought a gift for a thousand dollars for somebody? I'm like, a thousand bucks? Wow, that's a gift. Who? I want somebody very special to you, somebody that you really love and care for. Uh, men have done this. Uh, we buy a little thing called a diamond. It usually, you know, unless it's a cubic zirconia, it usually costs more than that. I want you to know I spent $4 in nickels getting that diamond ring out of that machine when I got engaged. It took me a long time, but I got it. No, you spend your hard-earned money on that. Why? They're important to you. They're valuable to you. So we do that. It's a measure. It's an indication of how valuable are to us. So too is God's love declared by the nature of His Son. What did He give? He gave Him everything. Now if you want to talk about somebody hard to buy a gift for, it's the person who has everything. That's Jesus. And you'll know the only gift He wants is you. The perfect unending love relationship between God the Father and God the Son. They didn't need us. They didn't need us. He wants fellowship with us. And then in verse 36, it talks about the salvation of God. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. God, in His great love for us, offers us the most precious gift He has. That is His Son. You see, eternal life is not some other thing. Eternal life is the Son. If you have Jesus, you have eternal life. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have it. 
I don't care what else you've done. It does not matter your pedigree. It does not matter your education. You must have Jesus. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. You see, God's system of accountability works like this. It's says pretty simple. If you believe, you have eternal life. Whoever believes in the Son has life. If you believe not, then the wrath of God is on him. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, but God's wrath remains on him. It remains. We are born into sin, and his wrath is on us, and it remains until the blood of Jesus cleanses us. And then we are set free. I wish putting your name on the church roll would do it. I'd get the yellow pages and write everybody's name in the church roll. That won't do it. You must believe the testimony of Jesus. He said, if you die without me, you will go to a devil's hell. He didn't create it for you. He created it for the devil and his demons. But you can choose to go there by rejecting the only way in heaven, God's Son. Get the wrath off of you. Get it off. Receive his Son and receive eternal life. At the end of the month, you receive a checking statement. Or you used to. You know, everything's green now. It's paperless. You get it on the computer somewhere. But you know, at the end of that statement, it tells you your balance. Very rarely is the bank wrong. Amen? They'll tell you that. <laughs> but sometimes they are. But do you know that one day you're going to receive an account statement for your life? It's the account statement from the bank in heaven. And there will be no errors. And there will be no appeals. When it says at the bottom, he has the son, then you have eternal life. If it says at the bottom, you do not have the son, then the wrath of God will remain on you for all eternity. No arguments, no debates, no questions. That's just the way it is. So make sure that your life is in Christ. Make sure that you're not trying to work to get in. You won't make it. Make sure that it's by the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus. Have I said that? It's by the blood of Jesus. Don't let me say it so many times you miss it. It is by the blood and only by the blood of Jesus Amen. that you will get into heaven. A few years ago, I read an article discussing school children and all the shootings. It was crazy. It started with Charles Andy Williams. He began shooting in the bathroom and then around the courtyard. He had Reloaded at least two times, firing 30 shots, witnesses say, as they scrambled for cover. At the end, he had shot 15 students, killing two of them. You heard of that horrible crime. Probably remember it. But what shocked me was in that same week that I read this a few years ago, were the other things that happened that same week that I didn't hear about. Number one, a 16-year-old was arrested in Noblesville, Indiana, for threatening to take a bomb to school. Number two, a 14-year-old boy was arrested in El... Elm Grove, Wisconsin, for bringing a gun to middle school with between 50 and 100 rounds. Number three, Patrick Andrew Smith, 18, from Walkersville, Maryland, was arrested for emailing students at Santana High saying he would finish what Andy started. Number four, a 14-year-old girl who shot a 13-year-old girl in a Pennsylvania lunchroom. Number five, a 17-year-old at Bayshore High School in Franklin, Florida, who took a 9mm loaded gun to school, all in the same week. God, help us. We need Jesus. And we need Him to reign supreme. I read an article about the Secret Service. You know, they're pretty good. They protect the president. They conducted a study on all the mass shootings which had begun. And they said there were two things in common for every single shooting. Number one, the students thought about it in advance. Number two, the students told somebody about it. Many of them simply never reported it. The solution was partly given by Mr. Condrell, an author of Whippy Parents from Toddler to Teen, How Not to Raise a Brat. You know, that ought to be required reading for every parent. He said, children need two parents who can nurture, provide, and protect them. And that takes maturity that too many children have fathers who have abandoned them. This rejection can cause a lifetime of hurt that never goes away. Never goes away. You see, kids need more than fundamental parents who love them. Yes, that's good, but they need more. They need to know that Christ is supreme. You see, the supremacy of Christ is the only thing that can change a person from the inside out. 
We can change them from the outside in. We can put them in prison and make them do what we want them to do. And when they get out, has the inside changed? If it hasn't, they simply go back to doing what they did before. Talk to somebody who doesn't know that firsthand. As a dad who had a high recidivism rate, I understand. I've seen it firsthand. You can change them from the outside in. Tell them when to eat. Tell them when to go to the bathroom. Tell them when to sleep. But it doesn't change their heart. We've got to change their heart. And the only thing that can do that is Jesus living inside them. Have they seen that change in you? Have you changed from the inside out? Have you been saved, redeemed, born again? Have you been washed in the blood of Jesus? You can be. It happens from the inside out. Then you'll experience real joy, real peace, and thank God, real forgiveness. It's a whole new world out there when Jesus lives on the inside. How do we do that? We do that through a simple prayer. And I would invite you to pray this prayer with me. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? If you would like to receive Jesus, if you would like to pass from the wrath of God, which is on you now, if you've not received Him, to forgiveness, to having eternal life. And pray a prayer like this with me. Say, Father, forgive me. Jesus, save me. Holy Spirit, live in me. Now, Heavenly Father, we are in crisis. You know that. You know that our families are at stake. God, you know as I rode downtown yesterday morning and I heard the gay agenda. And I heard them talk about reaching out to our children and teaching them to think correctly from the beginning. God help us. Help us to teach them the Bible. Help us to teach them the testimony of Jesus. So that they might pass from the wrath of God to the blessings of God. Nobody is beyond your ability to Thank you that my sin was not so great 